Welcome everybody. First of all, happy Earth Day. What a wonderful way to celebrate our beautiful planet by learning all about the soil in which all life uh, originates and comes from. We have a super exciting uh, session today um, all about soil microbes and like this really incredible world beneath our feet that we don't even think about. And so Jennifer Moore is here and we're so excited uh, for her to share her knowledge and just open our eyes to uh, the wonderful world of microbes. So my name is Annie Bronas and I am an education and outreach specialist at Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. So Tualatin SWCD, um, our mission is to create a sustainable, productive, and healthy environment for the Washington County uh, community. So we serve residents um, by providing educational opportunities like this, Soil School, and providing um, advice about how people can conserve their natural resources. Um, and we also have some financial assistance, whether that's through grants or cost share programs. Um, we have a couple different avenues for that. So check out our website to see our full offerings. Um, no matter if you live in an apartment building or if you have a farm um, or you're in a forest, we have something that we think can help you um, enhance your natural resources. Now, Soil School, um, we're, we're doing this in partnership with West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. So they're a very similar organization. Um, their mission is to provide resources, information, expertise, uh, to inspire people to actively improve their air and water quality, fish and wildlife habitat, and of course, soil health. They serve residents of Western Multnomah County, Savi Island, and a portion of the Bonnie Slope neighborhood. Um, they help those folks with conservation planning, weed management, native plants, habitat restoration, and school gardens. Now, uh, we are using a Zoom webinar. So it's slightly different than Zoom meetings, which I'm sure everybody is super familiar with at this point. Um, but so you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a Q&A button. That is where um, you can plug in any questions that you have. We're gonna save 10 minutes at the end of the presentation um, to ask questions. So put your questions in there if they come up during the presentation. If you see someone that had the same question that you were gonna ask, instead of writing it twice, you can actually thumbs up the question. And that's helpful for me because it'll bump that question up to the top of the list and then I know, ooh, we really need to make sure we get to that question. Now, we might run out of time and won't be able to get to all questions, um, but Jennifer has been super, super cool and said that we can email her with other questions. So I will provide her contact information so you can uh, email her with any kind of micro question that we didn't get to today. Um, and so yeah, a little bit about Jennifer. So Jennifer Moore joined the USDA Agricultural Research Service just this March, actually. She is a research soil scientist in Corvallis, Oregon. Her research focuses on soil health and soil carbon in forage, grass, and cover crop seed production systems. She has over 25 years of experience in soil science research, including work in multiple cropping systems and natural landscapes across the country. Before joining the Ag Research Service, she's held positions as the Climate Initiative Director at American Farmland Trust, the Western Soil Health Team Leader with NRCS Soil Health Division, and as an Associate Professor of Soil and Environmental Microbiology at Texas Tech University. She holds a Bachelor's in Biology uh, and Environmental Studies from Bingham University and she also has a uh, master's degree and a PhD uh, in soil science from Iowa State University and Oregon State University. Now, without further ado, let's hear from Jennifer. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and welcome everybody. I'm really honored to be Ooh, here Oh, Jennifer, today. you're really, really quiet. Is that on my side? Hmm. Can you talk one more time? I wanna make yeah. sure. There you uh, go. Hello. Okay. It was probably I my didn't do anything. 
Okay. Yeah, I was just going to check before we got going. All right, thanks so much. There you go. Okay. Um, do you see my screen normally? Good, a thumbs up from, I can actually see you, Annie. Right. Okay, great. Yes, all right. Well, thank you everybody for joining today. I'm so honored to be here on Earth Day of all days to um, share with you some of my excitement and passion about this amazing world below ground. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Soil Microbes, the Unseen World Beneath Our Feet. And uh, again, thank you to the organizers of Soil School 2021 and the invitation to share with you and hopefully inspire you to reconsider as you walk across your garden or your yard or any uh, forest on your next hike to think about now this amazing world of living organisms that are hard at work for us and for our earth. And so I'm going to just recap soil health principles and practices. If you've joined in other sessions for Soil School, this has already been covered, so I won't spend a lot of time, um, but we will kind of just set the stage and then really kind of dive more deeply into the major functions of soil and the biological connections um, that the, the communities possess. Uh, we'll talk about what, who the soil biological community, who they are and what they do. And then I'll finish up if hopefully there's time um, to provide some signs of soil health that you can look for in your field or garden. And again, if there's time at the very end, I would, uh, I would be amiss if I didn't try to link the whole concept of soil health, soil microbes to climate change and climate mitigation um, in light of, of Earth Day today. So soil health principles. Uh, NRCS uh, proposes the four basic principles of managing for soil health. So these are to minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover, maximize biodiversity, and maximize the continuous living roots. Um, and in the middle here is just a collage of all different organisms from tiny microscopic fungi and nematodes, protozoa to, you know, I call them the creepy crawly, you know, centipedes, millipedes, earthworms, mites, you name it, it's there below ground. And these, the first two principles on the right-hand side to minimize disturbance and maximize soil cover, these focus on the protection of the microbial habitat, namely what we refer to as soil aggregates in soil science. And we'll talk about that more uh, later on and soil organic matter, the house, the habitat of where the organisms live and their, um, they're a resource for food as well. And organic matter, as we know, provides nutrients to our plants and helps absorb water to, to create a healthy ecosystem. This side of the four soil health principles and practices that support them helps to um, minimize and reduce erosion and runoff risks, keeping our soils and fertilizers and chemicals on site and out of our waterways. So really important, not only for the productivity of what's growing in the soil, but also to ensure we have really high quality water. Um, additional benefits include buffering soil temperatures from really wild extremes, right? Because it's covered, the ground is protected. So it's an insulative blanket, if you will, on the soil. And this also helps to reduce water loss from evaporation. The left-hand side, the other two principles, maximize living roots and biodiversity. This is the feed and the fuel of these organisms. Um, and so we can do this in a variety of ways, um, but the principles and the practices that support the left-hand side helps to provide diverse carbon sources and biochemicals, again, fueling the soil organisms and stimulates the plant microbe interactions resulting in breaking disease cycles increasing not just maintaining organic matter. So this we can't get something out of nothing. So by feeding and fueling the system, we help to build organic matter in our soils um, and enhancing nutrient cycling, as well as because of this diverse side of the spectrum, we're helping to increase predator and pollinator populations. So you, I like to kind of distill the four principles back when I was with NRCS to two simple principles, and that is to protect and feed. And if you can kind of remember those two pieces and choose practices that address the protection and the feeding of the biology in your soils, you really um, can't go wrong. 
And so with that, there are a whole array of practices that can be utilized to support healthy soils and to address these four principles. Um, to minimize disturbance and maximize cover, one of the classic approaches is to reduce our tillage frequency um, uh, and depth and, and intensity, um, ideally going to a no-till system if possible. Uh, other practices include how we manage the residues, retaining the residues on site. We can add mulches, compost, and even biochar. And I think uh, Dr. Kristen Tripp um, from our ARS will be talking with, with you all uh, soon about biochar. On the left-hand side, some of these also address uh, disturbances in, in soil cover, such as cover crop. In fact, cover crop uh, is really addressing three of the four practices. So it's a great tool uh, to use to minimize that disturbance, to cover the soil, you're maximizing diversity and you're really you know, providing that living root. Anytime you can add perennials to the rotation and wherever we can to incorporate livestock or animals into our system is really, really valuable and can help accelerate a lot of the, the functionality that our soils provide. So no shortage of practices um, and ideally you try to choose practices that hit all four of these principles. And what I really want you to kind of come away with at the end is that soil organisms are responsible for all major functions in soils, from breaking down organic residues, decomposing that material at the surface, creating organic matter below ground. They're the eye of the needle through which like nutrients pass. So they're really critical for releasing plant available nutrients. They enhance soil structure. They build solid aggregates that help protect against erosion. And in doing so, they're increasing how much water gets inside of our soil rather than ponding and running off and causing uh, flooding uh, problems and other water quality negatives. They also help to suppress weeds that enhances plant growth. Uh, growth some organisms form a team partnership with plant roots called symbiotic associations, and their impacts are really synergistic, meaning one plus one does not equal two, it equals three or four or five. Um, so anytime we can stimulate those symbiotic associations, that's really valuable. They also can keep populations in check. When there's a healthy, balanced population, they kind of have their own population control. So even if there's a pathogen pres present, the populations are kept at a minimum. And then without microbes, we wouldn't be able to detoxify the pollutants that inevitably wind up in our systems. And so they're incredibly important for that as well. And so who are they? What do they do? Soils are incredibly diverse. In fact, they're home to over 25%, a quarter of all living species on earth can be found below ground. What an amazing, um, warehouse, right, of genetic diversity that exists below ground. Uh, oftentimes we see in the reports that a single teaspoon of a healthy soil can have millions of individuals of, of microbes, usually bacteria and fungi, and thousands of different species or types of those uh, bacteria and fungi in, in soil. And a whole shovelful can have 300 feet of fungal hyphal networks that are extending throughout um, that single shovelful. So very diverse, very active and, and impactful. So let's kind of break it down. Um, so in an acre of soil, a healthy soil, there are 8,000 to 10,000 pounds of biological life below ground, excluding the roots. So this is the equivalent weight of an African elephant. So in one acre, you have the equivalent of an elephant below ground. It needs to be fed, it needs to be protected, um, and it needs help to support what it's trying to do below ground. There are the equivalent weight of four to five cows of bacteria and fungi in that acre, anywhere from a half to a single cow of just earthworms alone. Uh, the equivalent weight of a sheep in protozoa, their single-celled organisms really uh, important for nutrient cycling and population control, and about one to two rabbit worths of soil fauna. So all of the insects and the you know mites and centipedes, um, millipedes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So really diverse. A, an elephant is living. The equivalent weight of an elephant is below ground in a single acre. That is pretty impressive. 
Okay, so what are they doing? I mentioned decomposition and formation of organic matter. So when residues hit the surface of the soil, they're immediately attacked by organisms. Usually they're the fauna, the, the, the creepy crawlies, the, the centipedes, the beetles, the, the worms that come up and they're breaking down and putting the, the organic residue below ground. When they do that, they're actually forming through a process called mineralization, plant available nutrients. So ammonium, sulfate, phosphate. This is through the release of organic material into inorganic or these plant available nutrients. So really critical for nutrient cycling. For every pound, or sorry, not pound, for every 1% of organic matter, we have 10,000 pounds of carbon. We have 1,000 pounds of nitrogen and about 100 pounds of phosphorus. To put that in um, perspective, Willamette Valley soils are usually pretty rich in organic matter and they typically can have four or five, 6% organic matter. Some places in Oregon, they can be 20% or more, really impressive amounts. So lots of nutrients that are slowly released and not as easily lost to the so uh, system uh, through leaching. Um, and so another really cool thing that happens in plants and root, uh, microbes and roots and soils is another one of those symbiotic associations is nitrogen fixation. And this is when a bacterium actually comes in and it attacks and infects the root. But in this case, it's not a negative infection. It actually creates free nitrogen fertilizer for that plant. So all your legumes, for example, are um, nitrogen fixers and they help to house in these little nodules. You can see in this fava bean uh, plant, these little nodules inside of here, it's a whole factory of bacteria that are taking nitrogen out of our atmosphere they're splitting the really hot, you know, strong triple bonds of dinitrogen gas in our atmosphere, and they're splitting it up and they're making ammonium, ammonia that the plant can then use. We do that too. It's a process called Heiber Bosch, and but we take enormous amounts of energy, heat, pressure, and we can make nitrogen fertilizers. Um, you may have heard of some of the major explosions of fertilizer plants going up, or Unfortunately, when some of those products are used to, to make bombs, that immense power and energy is released. So I just want you to pause for a second and think about these tiny little bacteria inside of a tiny little root on a nice warm spring day like today are making nitrogen fertilizer all by themselves. Pretty incredible. incredible. There's also another association between now fungi and plant roots, and this is called mycorrhizae. Myco, uh, mycorrhizae is a Greek word, mycos meaning uh, fungi and rhizae meaning roots, so fungal root association. These associations, I kind of think of them as hair extensions for the plant roots. So instead of the, hopefully you can see my um, mouse, um, instead of just having access to, in, to nutrients and water in this zone right around the roots, the rhizosphere, the sphere around the roots, they actually extend way out into the soil. And in doing so, they have more acquisition to nutrients. Phosphorus is a big one, as well as um, water. So in this case, plants give up five or 20% of the carbon that they make through photosynthesis to feed the fungi. And the fungi in return increase the rooting surface area 10 to 40 times, depending. Um, they also can help to suppress uh, pests and diseases, and they build networks that help to create soil aggregates in, the, in a hair like structure. So mycorrhizae, fungi root symbiosis, nitrogen fixation, bacteria root symbiosis, two really important um, components in our systems, in our soil systems. Okay, and then another piece, this is just another recap of that fava bean. Another process is for phosphorus to be um, extracted or mined through unique bacteria and fungi. So this is a slide that just shows how much is released, how much phosphorus is in, released in the presence of fungi in the green bars compared to the blue bars, which has no fungi in the, in the culture. What they do, phosphorus is a really unique element and it has a narrow availability of pH. So right around six or seven, phosphorus is available. If it's too acidic, it binds to um, different 
elements in the soil and it becomes insoluble and not available to plants. It can be there, but it's not available. In our case, in this case, fungi can come in and they literally will extract that phosphorus that's bound to that mineral form um, and creating available phosphorus. So another really neat um, process. And in addition to fungi doing this, there are also bacteria that can solubilize that phosphorus as well. And I mentioned earlier, earlier that microbes are really important to form stable aggregates. These aggregates um, are important to protect the soil from erosion. It helps to sustain the impact of raindrops as well as wind that is uh, flowing across the surface. And um, there's two different ways that the aggregates can be formed and, and, and protected, um, protecting the soil from erosion. The first is the physical enmeshment. So literally like a hairnet in this case, the, the roots and the fungal hyphae kind of form a net around the soil particles and physically enmesh and protect that soil. Another way is through biochemical glues that are released from bacteria and fungi. So this is a really high powered microscope. Uh, this is a soil mineral here. This is a bacterium. And this is the ooey ooey gooey substance that that bacterium is releasing. And when you get enough of them together, they're helping to help hold that soil together and create the glues that form the aggregates that help create that protection from erosion. This is another uh, uh, high powered microscope uh, image where the minerals of soil are being uh, attached by a um, filament from a bacterium called actinobacteria. But fungi have this, they're more popular. This is a fungal hyphae. This is just with my phone camera um, from a, a site actually out in Leavenworth. And you can see how the hyphae, these white filaments from the fungi are, are holding the particles together. And I like to, Think about Spider-Man in that case, you know, uh, you know, releasing the the web to hold the bus from falling off of the the, the bridge and and you know protecting and saving the day. The microbes truly are superheroes in the, the soil. And this is one example. And so what does this mean? Good aggregation basically translates into good infiltration. When a heavy rain event happens or an irrigation event, water goes into the ground and it helps to be stored there or filter through to refuel the, the aquifers uh, below ground, um, or and or it's stored in that soil for later use by the plant. When we have poor, poor aggregation, we don't get the water infiltrating into the ground. A crust forms and we, and instead of nice aggregates that have good pore spaces to get water in, uh, the raindrops form, they hit the ground, particles fly apart, and then they form a seal or a crust. And once that happens, water can't get into the ground, so we have ponding. And so classically, tillage tends to disrupt the aggregates. It breaks up the fungal hyphae, it exposes those glues, and, and the soil loses that good structure that uh, otherwise is held together. In a no-till system, especially with cover crops, where you have lots of organic matter and microbes, you get good aggregation, you get good glues, and you get good water movement. Okay, so then another um, component of soils are the bigger organisms, the fauna, earthworms, beetles, centipedes, and other larger fauna. These are the movers and shakers of the soil. Um, I consider them like the construction crews that are moving residues, they're translocating it from the surface below ground, they're chopping it up and increasing the surface area so the microbes can come and eat. Um, and they're creating channels for water and air they're creating aggregates also, especially um, earthworms. They're also helping microbes to build organic matter, again, by accelerating decomposition and, and formation of that organic matter. And in the case of, uh, of earthworm channels, this is a former earthworm channel. You can see how dark it is. It's, it's rich in organic matter. It's loaded with microbes. Um, it has the perfect pH, the perfect aeration, the perfect water holding capacity. And when those channels are not disrupted, then new roots can grow and they have like this um, luxury kind of environment from which to grow from. Earthworms are pretty incredible too. They can turn over the top six inches of soil in 10 to 20 years to just give you that impression. 
And um, I am microbe centric. I'm a soil ecologist, microbial ecologist by training in biochemists. And so sometimes I tend to forget about the importance of soil fauna, the larger organisms in soil. And I found this great video in, this, in a time lapse, 15 week time lapse with residue being decomposed at the surface. And you can see earthworms and beetles and organisms coming up, shredding that, organi uh, that organic matter and bringing it below ground and actually forming organic matter as, as we watch it. On the left-hand side, it's just microbes. So the fungi are there, you can start to see there's some mold growing, um, there's some slow decomposition, but without the fauna to help accelerate that, the whole system breaks down. And unfortunately, the larger organisms are the most sensitive and they tend to drop out the first with some um, with uh, soils that are exposed to de degrading practices. So anything we can do to protect that, that layer to protect the larger organisms are gonna have a much bigger impact overall. So um, microbes are a piece of the puzzle, but we can't forget about our larger uh, so fauna uh, above ground. Um, this is a slide to illustrate how microbes communicate and defend plants from pathogens. And so in this case on the left, um, there is a pathogen that's happening um, through the stomata of the plant, and it is attacking through above ground um, mechanisms. And what happens is that sends a signal below ground to accelerate and, and um, stimulate the bacteria that, that live there. And so this is a, um, a root channel here darkened, and then the green fluorescent is dyed bacteria. So they're, they're been, the cavalry is coming, right? The, they've been called to action. They come in and they swarm the root to first protect it so that while the plant is stressed, nothing else is gonna happen to that root. They're gonna protect it. And also they're releasing a chemical that tells the plant up above ground, hey, you're being attacked, close your stomata, batten down the hatches, lock the doors, close the windows. You know, you need some help <laughs> to, to ward off this pathogen. That's one mechanism. Another mechanism is through um, with the, the mycorrhizal fungi, the hyphae. So these filaments, can extend through the soil and they can connect two plants together. In this case, this plant over here is perfectly healthy, nothing being attacked, but it's nearby this plant that is being attacked. But again, there's a signal that comes through the soil. It tells the mycorrhizal fungi, hey, go tell your neighbor, there's a bad guy in the neighborhood, close your doors, lock, lock your doors and <laughs> close your windows. Um, and so it's protected as well. Finally, there's a mechanism where the plant releases these volatile compounds that help to call in the air force, these, um, these wasps that can feed on the aphids that are now attacking this plant. And so through the release and this communication calls in SOS from above, above ground and these predatory wasps will come in and attack the aphids. But they have to be close by in order to get the signal. So that's where borders come in of our fields and how we can have herbaceous, you know, uh, border strips that not only attract pollinators, but can also attract beneficial organisms like these wasps. And this is just an example of how lots of researchers are looking for probiotics. And so in this, this is a, a study out of Australia where they added what they thought was a, a known um, bacteria that can help stimulate plant growth. Uh, and so this is the growth of the corn plant uh, after a couple of weeks without the microbes added. And this is what they look like after the microbes were added. This is great. There's lots of work all over the world being done on this. The only problem is that not everything translates well from the greenhouse to the field. So lots of potential, but there's lots of room for improvement. And so a lot more research is needed to identify what those drivers are to make sure what we think is gonna happen is actually gonna happen in the field. And then I just wanted to emphasize um, the fierce competition and the population control that happens below ground in a healthy soil. So this is an example um, of protection from a pathogen called Rhizoctonia solani. Um, and in this case, this is what the roots look like when the system has springtails, these little critters in the soil. Um, and this is what, the roots look like without the springtails. And so something is there with the presence of these springtails that is 
um, impacting the deleterious effect of this pathogen and helping to protect the roots. Without their presence, again, something is breaking down um, and that pathogen is able to negatively affect root growth. The nematode trapping fungi are one of my favorite um, organisms. These fungi form these nooses um, and the nematodes are swimming happily through the soil water and some kind of chemical signal is released by the fungi. The nematode swims through, it swims through the noose. Another chemical signal happens, it clamps down on that um, nematode and starts literally sucking the life out of it. Um, really great for especially the, the nematodes that cause um, uh, uh, plant diseases. Uh, another organism that loves to eat nematodes is, are mites. And here's an example of that happening in soils. These guys, I really just like the name, the vampiriads. I think of them like vampires. These are protists or protozoa, these single-celled organisms that live in soils. Um, and they're actually eating a fungal root pathogen involved in uh, what's called take-all disease, common in, for example, wheat. And they basically puncture the fungal root and start sucking the life out of it. Um, uh, a single protozoan, this simple cell, a single or celled organism um, is capable of eating billions of bacteria a day. So population control, like bacteria reproduce really rapidly. So they need to be kept in check because anything out of whack is gonna throw the whole system off, off base. And then this is another example. In this case, this is a soybean cyst nematode, really bad guy. Um, parasitized um, by a particular fungus. It just looks like a couple of threads through the soil, but it's releasing a major chemical that is um, parasitizing this particular fungus. Um, and so, you know, I kind of focus on these two nematodes uh, that are the bad guys in soils, but nematodes are also really equally important um, for inducing positive things like nutrient cycling. A lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus that's released in our soils couldn't be done as well if the nematodes weren't there. Unfortunately, kind of like most things, the bad guys get all the press. And so we tend to emphasize, um, rightfully so, uh, the negatives that nematodes can have on crop production because it's really damaging financially. But if there's a healthy system there, We've got the nematode trapping fungi. We've got these other fungi that can parasitize. We've got mites and protists and all these organisms that are helping um, naturally to control uh, overpopulation. Okay, so then want to just kind of finish up quick with signs of soil health you can look for in your field or garden. Um, there are surface indicators such as surface cover, crusting, residue breakdown and ponding. Um, basically, if you see anything like this, you have a problem, okay? So lots of erosion, crusting, cracking, you're getting tractors stuck in the, the field, you have lots of water erosion, not so good. There's a YouTube video that you can watch that talks about surface cover. Um, this one is physical indicators, so something called penetration resistance. You can use a fancy tool um, that costs a bunch of money, or you can insert a wire flag into the ground and if it goes in um, easily at least 10 inches, you're pretty good to go, but you kind of want to move around. You can look at the structure and the color of your soil, darker granular crumb-like structure is what you want. You can look at aggregate stability and of course you want to not see erosion. Um, so structure, crumb-like cookie crumbs, think of like taking Oreos, smashing them up into pieces and that crumb-like structure that they, um, provide, that's what you're looking for. You don't want platy structure like in the top picture where they look like smushed layers of sheets of soil or plates of soil. That's usually an indication of compaction and you want dark soils. Finally, you can do this really easy. It's called a slump test or a slake test. Uh, I like the slump test a little bit better. It doesn't require dried soil. Um, and I have a video here that you can also look at that shows you how to do that. Um, and then you just hopefully can see signs of life, uh, visible organisms, worms, beetles, millipedes, ants, et cetera, or signs of organism activity, earthworms. So they make these middens, right? These little deposits at the surface. Um, 
um, fungal hyphae you can sometimes see as you dig in the soil. You can smell the soil. Uh, if it has a nice earthy tone, then you've got good biological activity. Oh, and then down here, um, the soil, your undies challenge. This is a great thing. I also saw it was uh, promoted on the Tualatin uh, Soil Water Conservation District. I encourage you to check this out. And I, I'm just going to leave it there because it's, you know, soil your undies challenge. Go, go for it and check it out. Um, and then, let's see. This is what you don't want to see, right? J-rooted um, plants, uh, you know, small, straggly, uh, lack of branching, that kind of thing. That's a sign you usually have compaction in your soils. And then um, I want to just end, if there's time, um, to talk about the connections between soil health, soil microbes, and climate change. Um, wanted to emphasize that soils contain two to three times more carbon than what's stored in our atmosphere and all of the vegetation on earth combined. So an enormous sink of carbon exists in the soil. So what we do and how we manage our soil can have big impacts on that, right? We wanna keep that carbon in the soil and not have it released back out um, when it's not balanced by inputs. And so, um, how we kind of do that is just kind of coming back to the soil health principles where we want to add and protect those processes and practices have to be greater than the removal and losses. You know, we recognize, right, that we have to remove things from the soil. We harvest um, our products because we like to eat, right? And we have to eat and that's just part of it. And so what we want to do then is balance those removals with natural organics, um, that, that through cover cropping, diverse species, crop rotations, um, compost, mulches, those kinds of things. We wanna give back to the soil so that it can perform. And again, just choosing practices that both build and protect are gonna get us there, as well as feeding the soil um, microbes and, and fauna to optimize those functions. Um, I'm gonna, well, I'll go through this. So, when, when we choose practices that do this, that help to feed and protect the biological community, we increase soil organic matter, SOM. When we do that, we increase the amount of carbon that's sequestered or stored. So the carbon from the atmosphere is photosynthesized. It's released through plant roots. Microbes break it down. Some of it goes back up, but ultimately it's built in the soil if we protect and feed. Also, soil health management systems can help to increase weed suppression, and therefore it's going to reduce the usage of herbicides and fuels by lessening the amount that goes on um, the field. That alone is a contribution to climate change. By increasing nutrient cycling, natural cycles through nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, through mineralization, and these other pathways I talked about, we get to decrease how much fertilizers we rely on, those synthetic fertilizers. That's gonna reduce nitrous oxide, another major greenhouse gas. It's gonna reduce our energy use and it's also going to reduce um, water pollution, all contributing to climate mitigation and resiliency. These systems, again, increase infiltration, increase water storage and decrease irrigation needs. That's gonna decrease flood risk, I got it. <laughs> And that insulative cover, our blanket, is going to reduce evaporation and buffer against temperature uh, extremes. And finally, by increasing the diversity and decreasing plant stress, we'll also be decreasing our reliance on pesticide use. Again, another energy intensive process and another trip in the field having uh, positive impacts on, on climate uh, and climate resiliency. Soil organisms are responsible for all major functions, feed and protect their home, their habitat, and they will optimize what they're doing for us and help to create a very healthy earth. And so with that, I thank you for your attention. Happy Earth Day to everybody. Um, I had to make a new uh, image here with the earth behind um, and then, you know, zoning in on soil health and the biological life force that's, uh, that's interacting. So ignore that. It really ends there. And, and then that's my um, email address um, for everybody. So thank you. And I guess we'll stop sharing and uh, answer any questions that we might have.
Thank you so much, Jen. Great stuff. Very exciting information. Um, we have a couple questions as well as a request to revisit a slide um, and have you kind of walk us through that. So it's great we've got some extra time. All right, first question is from Heather. Heather asks, which fungi release releases phosphorus and which bacteria? Then how do you know um, that you have that in your soil? Yeah, good question. Um, there are a whole array. There's not just one type. Um, they kind of get clumped as phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. And to be honest, I don't know the details of their genetics to, to tell you exactly which kind. Um, similarly for, um, for phosphorus, um, a lot of the mycorrhizal fungi though have special enzymes that can then release phosphorus and, or if they're in alkaline soils, they'll release certain acids that can mine and strip that phosphorus from the bound um, minerals. Um, you know, things that tend to reduce those populations then reduce the presence of those organisms. So without a genetic test, um, you know, or a culturing test to see if you have them, you wouldn't really know if you have them or not. But we do know that heavy use of fertilizers tends to decrease their presence because if we add the nutrient that they're trying to otherwise expend energy to mine, then they're not going to be activated. Um, and also tillage when it's influencing those mycorrhizal fungi with the hyphae, um, that's also kind of uh, been shown to decrease their populations as well. So it's kind of a balance. You might need to add nutrients at first just to get good, healthy plant growth, but hopefully over time, you know, you might be able to step that back a little bit. Always having a soil sample and submitting it for a nutrient analysis is um, your best friend in that regard. Excellent. All right, uh, Jim, he says, my understanding is that the, most of the earthworms in this region are non-native. How, uh, or are they displacing other organisms, um, but at the same time, they're providing the same benefit or is their role in our soils an added benefit? Yeah, great question. I actually used to have a slide from um, Wisconsin and then one from California where they've shown the negative impacts of non-native earthworms on the ecosystem. So up in the Northern latitude states, um, they can kind of completely restructure an entire forest uh, system. And it's really kind of linked back, unfortunately, to the fishing industry and the incorporation of earthworms. So, um, you know, learn how to fly fish <laughs> or something, or don't, don't dump your earthworm container. There. In California, in the rangelands, they're trying to understand whether it's a negative or not. Um, it tends to disrupt the flow of nutrients, and some studies have suggested it helps to increase non-native plants and vegetation coming in as well. I don't know that there's been a lot of studies in Oregon specific on earthworm populations and you know natives versus non-natives. Um, and that kind of thing. But, but glaciation kind of wiped out some of them, but I, I think we might have a couple of natives, um, but, um, but I don't really know specifically for Oregon, it would be a great uh, research project for, for an earthworm scientist. Yeah. Great question, Jim. You know, I work in conservation and think about native species all the time, but not once have I thought about native worms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Megan asks um, how to improve heavily compacted soil without disturbance. Yeah, that's tricky. So one of the most successful um, ways that some people have had success are using um, like a, um, a tillage radish, for example. Um, so different cover crop species with, you know, big root rooted tubers, for example, can help to break that compaction down. Um, and then once that, if you don't disturb, you know, once that tuber dies, it leaves a huge hole in the soil, right? Then that can help get water down below. It helps aerate so that the plants that are then grown after it have a better fighting chance. Um, so the, that's one way to do it, accelerating and getting plants in the ground to naturally break up that compaction um, is, is a, a great tool. And you know, sometimes uh, that 
you know, there's different strategies and different opinions. There, there might be some light tillage that is necessary just to get you established. And that way, you know, you can get things off to a, a good start. Um, other, depending on your system, if you can afford it, then you can, you know, try to build it more slowly with a cover crop and, and no tillage disturbance. Um, it kind of depends. So reach out to local experts in that, in that case, for sure. So we've got two other questions that are related to this topic, and I have a feeling you're going to kind of repeat the same thing about, you know, needing to go have someone come to your property and give you one-on-one -on -one advice, which is what we do, mm -hmm. just letting y'all know. <laughs> um, so the, the two questions are, um, how can I change my compacted soil where grass is growing into healthy soil? And then what's the best way to till and cover crop before planting. So both kind of like how to, how to work with the soils. Yeah, again, I would just, I would recommend, um, that's a research question that actually my program uh, as well as our entire ARS unit is interested in exploring um, in the coming months and years. And so we hope to have more information um, about that for you. Uh, what can help to accelerate aggregation, um, help to reduce compaction uh, and, and that kind of thing. Diversification of your system, if you can uh, incorporate other plants that have different rooting structures so that not every plant has the same type of root. Um, and so anytime we can diversify and mix it up from a above ground perspective is gonna have below ground impacts as well. So, you know, those are two of the classic ways to, that uh, people explore to, to change their system. Um, there's the Western Cover Crop Council that's, um, you know, getting off the, the ground um, now and, um, you know, attending field days, reaching out to, you know, what uh, Annie just said with the soil water conservation cool. districts, NRCS, et cetera, and trying to learn what has worked for your neighbors and then trying it as well. You know, um, having a site visit, visit is really also important, depending on your organ, right, is so diverse. We're so diverse in our soils, our climate, all of the like 300 plus different crops that we grow. Um, and so it's really hard to give a blanket answer, but, um, but there are success stories out there and we can connect you um, with those individuals. So feel free to, to reach out as well. Can you please explain nutrient cycling again? <laughs> So nutrient, do you want me to open that one? In the very beginning, is that the slide that is being requested uh, or is there another one? No, that there was another slide. Okay, um, we'll, we'll start here. Okay, <laughs> so nutrient cycling. Um, residues, right, plant leaf. All right, let's just think about leaves hitting the surface of your yard, right? They're gonna be broken down like in that video that I shared and that surface area is exposed and it's, I consider it like chewing your food, right? You chew your food in part to break up and increase the surface area so the enzymes in your mouth and gut can go to work to guess what? Extract the nutrients that are in that organic chopped up residue that we just ate. So similarly, the bacteria or uh, the, the um, soil animals, right? Come in, they chop it up. The bacteria and fungi then come in. They have a whole arsenal of enzymes just like in our mouth and our gut and they release those enzymes that breaks down that nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur that's in that leaf. So when they do that, they release that organically bound form into plant available forms. And so they basically are the, the chemists that transform that phosphorus, nitrogen and sulfur bound in that organic leaf tissue into this what's called an inorganic form and release to the, to, the, to the soil for plant uptake. So that's it in a nutshell. And then also just, um, I mentioned like nematodes and protozoa. So bacteria, like we're made up of nutrients, right? If when we decompose <laughs> or if we just did on the ground, um, we would also release nutrients. Same with bacteria, right? Same with fungi, same with a deer, an animal, whatever that falls to the ground. Um, so the bacteria and the fungi also have nutrients and trapped in their bodies. And there's a bazillion of them, right, in the, in the soil. And so as they die and are decomposed and eaten, the nutrients embodied in them also releases. And so nematodes love to eat bacteria and fungi. 
protozoa, that single celled organism eating 6 million in a day, right, can release a lot of nutrients. And so that's how biology takes an organic form of nutrients that plants don't take up in general and converts it into a form that they can um, through decomposition. Does that help? Could draw it. You need a, I need a whiteboard so I can draw it out for you guys. <laughs> yeah, nutrient cycling is definitely a, a pretty technical process. Um, yeah. I always take like organic stuff and make it into plant available stuff. Right. Like with nitrogen fixation, I think of it as like, there's nitrogen in the air, Oh, legumes, put it in the soil, <laughs> like at the simplest level. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That one's even cooler, but yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, okay. A couple more. It's really great that you ended early because we have so much time to talk. I about hope this. to. Yeah. I wanted to get questions. So. Yeah. So, um, what is soil salivation and how does that relate to soil health? Can you spell that word? S-A-L-I-V-A-T-I-O-N. I don't know what this is. I have no idea. I would love to know what it is. I've never heard of it. Is it like salivate? Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Looks like to me, uh, uh, Mr. Jones. Solarization? Is, is, are they thinking of solarization? Oh yeah, maybe when you put the, the tarp on your grass to kill your grass. Maybe we um, can wait for some yeah, clarification. Jones, that. If you want to, we'll move on to another question. If you want to um, elaborate on what you're talking about a bit in the chat box and we can, we can come back to it. Oh, or if somebody else knows what it means. Or salination. Oh, salination, salination. Um, so that's, uh, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, a saline, it's the creation of saline soils. Um, I would be really surprised if we have to worry about that on our side of the mountains. Um, it's much more typical on the east side where salts can accumulate in soils and that tends to be in high evaporation zones that don't get a lot of um, rain, right? That can then leach the salts out of the, the system. And so, um, yeah, it should not be a problem over here on the, the west side, although perhaps a little bit in the summer we could, but it would never accumulate to a, a level in our soils that would be damaging to plants because we get enough rain in the winter to, to move those salts out. That makes me think of the great salt plains where Burning Man happens. Uh -huh. <laughs> Nevada. That seems like the type of thing this would happen in. Definitely uh, over on, the, on that side, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got one more question. And then I think the slide that we'd like to revisit would be a great way to kind of close out the presentation. Okay. Kind of sure. like the, big, all, the big points we, we want to take away. So last question is, how do you transfer from whatever is already growing, pasture, grass, for example, to a cover crop and then back again without tilling? Um, without uh, pesticides too, herbicides? Uh, you could graze it down as far as you could go and, uh, you know, almost kind of overgraze it um, to a point and be ready to overseed it as quickly as possible. That sometimes works. Um, you're going to get a lot of weed pressure in that. So it, you'd be in it for the long haul. It, and if you're talking about on a big scale, right, um, you could use like, um, uh, I think, and you'll know, um, what's that system when you put the cardboard down, you wet it up and then the lasagna, the lasagna method. Yeah. You if you're talking about a garden, you could do that. Um, but you know, that's a small area kind of approach. Uh, otherwise without, without herbicides or tillage, um, you can do it, but you're gonna, it's going to take a long, a long time to get there. So bring in some goats. So. It follows up with, so typically, I guess in a conventional operation, would you then, you would just have to till in order to get your cover crops established? Um, or some people I know have had success with, you know, herbicides, right, to chemically kill and burn down the vegetation. Um, and once you do that, you could come in quickly and reseed. You'll, you'll still get quite a bit of weed pressure, but if you can get a good healthy stand, um, then you can kind of overcome those that you know presence of the the former vegetation. Um, so it it is possible you might have to again it might take a couple of years if if you're not tilling if you kind of double whammy it you get there quicker but um, 
you know, but you, you want to try to disturb as least as possible. Um, and converting, you know, grasses to, 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 you know, annual production from a production perspective is, is good from a, you know, carbon perspective is usually a lot of loss of carbon to the atmosphere. So we want to try to do it as minimally as possible and come back in as quickly as possible with really good, you know, seed, seed cover, get the right depth, you know, do, do all of those uh, things by the book to, to revegetate as quickly as possible. Great questions, everybody. I love it when we get all this awesome discussion going on. Um, yeah, it seems like a lot of these questions are related to people's, you know, specific management goals and what they want from their property. So um, I really encourage everybody to reach out if you're in Washington County, you know, email um, us. We have a whole rural program, tons of experts know they can come out, look at your, your property and really work with you to figure out like what are the best steps to take to get where you want to go. Um, because it, you know, it, it varies so much as Jen said. So Jen, let's wrap it up by revisiting. It's okay. slide number five of That's your fine. presentation, at least in the PDF. Um, it's titled Soil Organisms Are Responsible for All Major Functions. Oh, I ended on it too. Okay, hold on. Oh, did you? Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's great. It's yeah, but I was really quick. Uh -huh. Okay, so how do I gotta get, gotta find Zoom. Share screen, team two. Uh, hold on, I gotta do this. Okay, um, I can't see you anymore, but I can hear you. <laughs> so is there a specific question or you wanted me to just kind of go over it one more time? Yeah, someone just wanted to see it again. So maybe oh. just going over it one more time. Sure, sure. So these are, um, some of the major functions that we think of when we think about healthy soils and plant productivity, right? We want, um, if, if you think about it, or, you know, if I were to, you, you might not use the same words, but you would probably come out with the same answer. If I asked you, what do you want your soils to do for you, right? You want to be, have a productive crop or vegetation growing. Um, you want it to resist erosion. You don't want it to blow away or to wash away. You want it to have internal nutrient, natural nutrient cycling to minimize how much synthetic fertilizers you want to put down. You want it to be naturally resistant to pest and pathogen pressures, right? So, um, and, and also weed pressures. So you want it to be healthy and diverse um, to, to be able to fight off these um, constraints or, or challenges for, for your system. And so all of those functions, and then, you know, for, for those of us interested in climate change and climate mitigation, a key piece of that is building organic matter. And with that comes carbon, at least, you know, about half of organic matter is, is carbon. And so we also want that. Um, and, and then, sorry, before I go further, organic matter is also really critical it acts like a sponge. It helps fluff up your soil. So there was some questions early about compaction. If we can build organic matter, we automatically help to lighten the soil because organic matter is um, very porous and it helps get that compaction down. So anything you could do, if you could add compost or mulches um, or that kinds of material, that's going to help accelerate as well. Okay. So, um, all of these functions are driven by the biological community that exists in our soils. So we don't get, we don't form organic matter without biology, right? If we, if we didn't have biology, that leaf that hits the ground would sit there and we would be swimming, right? In, in, in forest vegetation, right? We, it would never break down. So we need those bio, the biological community to break it down and form that organic matter that then has all of these really good um, functions. Plant growth promotion. I showed you the slide of adding um, specific bacteria that helped accelerate that um, crop, uh, that corn um, plant that was growing in the greenhouse. So there are specific bacteria called plant growth promoting bacteria. And so by stimulating those populations, or in some cases, adding them to your soil, you can stimulate plant growth. Those symbiotic associations, both nitrogen fixation, so bacteria and legumes, um, help to create natural 
nitrogen fertilizer without you doing a thing. Mycorrhizal fungi and plant roots helps with a whole bunch of things, aggregation, mining for that phosphorus, water uptake under drought conditions, for example. Those uh, symbiotic associations with fungus and roots are really important and helps to impart these other um, functions like nutrient and water uptake. Um, natural biological control. So if we have a healthy population and everybody's doing their job, they're keeping everybody else in check. So it's natural population control to the pathogens are there, kind of everything is everywhere sort of thing, um, but their populations are kept at a, at, a, at a base level that doesn't negatively impact your crop productivity. Detoxifying pollutants, so bioremediation, oil spills, um, chemical spills. There's not a bacteria or fungi out there that's not gonna be able to degrade um, those uh, toxic chemicals. And how they do that is another thing. Um, it's also really important for the agrochemicals that are added, right? We don't want those building up in soils and some of them do degrade um, chemically or, or you know, through, uh, um, you know, from the sun, but a lot of them are degraded more rapidly in the presence of, of microbes. So that's a good thing because we want those to break down before they make it to our, our water systems. Already talked about nutrient cycling, soil structure, right? The hair net with the fungi and the roots, and then the sticky glues that help form aggregates are gonna help to resist erosion. And that good aggregation gives good pore flow, good porosity, good air to the soil to get the water into the ground. And that's gonna reduce flooding. And it's also gonna help store that water because we've got the organic matter now that acts like a sponge for plant use in the summer months when the rains go away. Um, and then with a good cover crop, a good solid cover actually suppresses weeds and a lot of farmers report um, a reduction in, in herbicide usage. And then that can help offset some of the increases of herbicide use in a tillage and a no-till system. Because if you just no-till, the one of the biggest challenges is, is weed production, right? Um, so by coupling no-till with cover crops, then you get both um, the protection of the soil as well as uh, weed suppression. So that's a kind of a summary again, hopefully um, that, that helps. And, uh, and I really appreciate everybody's attention and thank you for making uh, this uh, fantastic Earth Day for me as well. Yay, thank you so much to Jen for sharing your expert knowledge with us. And thank you so much to our wonderful community that's like out there somewhere. And I see your little members here. Um, we really value, you know, y'all coming to help us, you know, conserve our shared natural resources. Um, if you have a question that's specific to your property, please reach out to, to Walton Soil and Water or West Multnomah Soil and Water if you're in their district. Also like us on Facebook, sign up for our newsletter, we're always sharing great activities, including soil your undies coming soon. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you everybody. So Bye. All right. Bye.